Well, it is time. So let's go ahead and get uh, started and we'll begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the day. We are grateful for your uh, love and your grace. We're grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to continue to uh, look deeply into your word and to look deeply into the tradition uh, of the Reformers, uh, particularly uh, Calvin and others who have uh, thought uh, closely about these matters and how to uh, best understand what uh, in the world you are doing and what you are doing in and through your Son and what you are doing through your church and what are the purposes for your glory. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us as we continue to engage in all of it, and we pray, Lord, that uh, you would bless our understanding and that you would help us, Lord. We confess that these uh, truths are not always uh, easy to uh, understand or to be reconciled to, so we pray for your grace uh, to be abundant as we consider the doctrines of grace. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Just um, some pl- preliminary uh, comments before we get back to um, the scintillating details of total depravity. Um, I wanted to just take a quick um, round the bend one more time on uh, the issues between um, the five remonstrances or the the, uh, the five points of Arminianism and the five points of Calvinism. It was, um, who was it? Mark Simons, who I thought asked a, a, a good question and a, and a um, reasonable question about whether or not the five points of Arminianism, as I shared them with you uh, last week, human ability, conditional election, indefinite atonement, resistible grace, and detectable grace, are those, is that nomenclature that Arminians would use, or is that nomenclature that Reformed folks are using? And it's definitely uh, Reformed folks. And I want to, um, I want to continue in um, my approach to charitable, being charitably Reformed. As I talked to you before about the uh, total reformed um, or the, the uh, tragic reformed. Total reformed, went, my mind went to the total return method, which is like an investment thing. Uh, and I wonder if there's a theological connection I could make with that. But uh, I want to be charitably reformed. And so I think in order to be charitably reformed, it's important to be uh, as honest and as um, clear with what uh, positions are that you might disagree with. And so I wanted to make sure that you all had a copy of the five articles, or what's known as the five articles of remonstrance, that were uh, drawn up in 1610 uh, by followers of Jacobus Arminius. Um, Remember, both Calvinism and Arminianism were not native to the individuals of Calvin and 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 Arminius, but they were uh, further developed by their disciples following their death. Uh, Clearly, the thinking was there in uh, seed form uh, by both of these men, but they were more clearly refined and systematized by their disciples and their followers. And so uh, you can see that the the articles uh, here are actually you know, slightly longer than just a word like, uh, or a phrase like uh, human ability, conditional election. And I want to be, again, as charitable as I possibly can. And we're not going to take the time to read all five articles. But what I want to suggest to you is that if you do, I think that you will find, as I have found, that there's, there's much to be commended in these articles. Um, it's not as though these are five uh, paragraphs of heresy. There's truth here. There's um, much to be uh, that I that I find agreement with, and um, I think it's important to uh, acknowledge that and to recognize that uh, the the Reformed Arminian debate is an intermural conversation. It's an internal conversation. This is not the same kind of a conversation between a Christian and uh, a Jehovah's Witness or a Christian and a Mormon. Those are different theologies. We're talking about a different. God, we're talking about different sources of authority. We're not appealing to the same scripture. And so the conversation between the Reformed uh, and the Arminian is an internal, intermural conversation. And so we're talking about and with brothers and sisters in Christ with whom we will spend eternity. Now, we may have, and I, you know, we may have uh, serious um, debate about what the Bible is teaching. We may have serious uh, distinctions that are being made. Uh, we may have serious disagreements about what the Bible is trying to communicate. But we're doing that with brothers and sisters in Christ. And so uh, the five articles of remonstrance are here for your uh, consideration. 
uh, not to, um, to try to convert anybody, but I think it's important that we allow <coughs> uh, the text or the, the position to be stated by those who wrote it and to uh, be honest in saying there's much here to, to be commended in terms of uh, how it is um, describing who God is and what uh, God is saying. So um, we're not going to take any time to read this. I just want to put this in your hands. Second of all, I want to make sure that I restate some of the purpose of this class. The purpose of this class is not to debate Arminianism. It's to state positively um, the positions of, of the Reformed faith. As I was preparing for this class, uh, there's a number of uh, books that I've been working through. Uh, here's a, a sampling of them. But out of them, uh, there are these four books, two companion books um, that, that I've been working through. I've, been, I've read these two, and I've been referencing these other two. These two are titled, Why I Am Not an Arminian and Why I Am Not a Calvinist. Uh, so Jerry Walls and Joseph Dongle and uh, Robert Peterson and Michael Williams are making the case against. Uh, in addition, I've been working through this past week uh, and before another book by Roger E. Olson called Against Calvinism. So these are, these are uh, refutations. They're, they're stating the position negatively, not negatively in terms of like a moral negative, but they're making the appeal as to why not. Only one of the four books um, that I've read has a positive title, For Calvinism. Uh, and this was written by Michael Horton, which may be a name that's familiar to some of you. Um, I'm not suggesting that Horton's book is superior to the other three because of the title, but what I am suggesting is that I prefer that title. Uh, I prefer that stance. I prefer to make a positive articulation of the Reformed tradition. Uh, I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time saying or trying to detail why I think uh, Arminianism is off base. There are books for that. There are other classes that can do that. That's not what my uh, intention is uh, here. I want to be charitable, and I want to make a positive uh, statement about uh, what's being taught in the Reformed tradition. Now, having said that, I also want to uh, share with you the second handout, which um, is, I hope, a value-free uh, simplification and systematization of the issues um, that are in view between Calvinism and Arminianism. Uh, this was uh, put together by the Chronicle and Background Charts of Church History by uh, Zondervan. It's an academic book. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at these uh, these these books, these chart books, uh, I was required to buy a few when I was uh, in college. There's about four or five of them out there. They're really, really helpful. There's one for church history, one for systematic theology. I'm trying to remember what the others are. Uh, I'm sorry, doctrine. It's, it's on doctrine. I see Scott has got a puzzled look. I think it was I doctrine. those two. Yeah, those two. And there's a few others that have come out recently. One on the New Testament, I think. Oh, they're really helpful uh, summaries and charts that, kind of, that take a lot of information and distill it and put it in, into a, a graph-type format. For those of us who are visual learners, uh, I'm a, I like to learn. Um, there's, a, there's audio learning, what is it? oral learning, they would call that, uh, visual learning, and then kinesthetic learning, which is my son. He only learns when he's in motion. Uh, and so if you have a son, you might be like that too. Uh, so this is a visual aid to kind of uh, very quickly go through the issues and the positions that are... Uh, held by Calvinists and Arminianists. Arminianists. So the view on original sin, uh, the Calvinist view, as we've been talking about and will continue with this morning, is total depravity and the guilt inherited from Adam. Uh, the Arminian view, and I would say that um, probably the Calvinist and the Arminianist view here is, is appealing to a broad conception. Uh, one of the things that I've been uh, interested in is I've been reading Against Calvinism uh, in Olson's book. Olson is really uh, taking to task, and he is taking them to the wood chipper. Uh, he's, he's looking at what he would call high Calvinist, or uh, there's a category of Calvinist that came out about, well, let's see, when was this published? This was published in 2011, yeah, so about 10, 15 years ago, called, perhaps you've heard of these folks, Young, Restless, Reformed. Has anybody heard of the Young, Restless, and Reformed? Is that a, a term of art? 
known by many. So the young, restless, and reformed group are what I would call the obnoxious reformed. They're new to it. They think it's interesting. They hold these positions very strongly. Uh, they, they really they don't, they haven't had time to let things season and marinate and germinate. They, they haven't round off any edges. It's, they're very sort of acerbic and angular in the way that they think about and, um, and present their view of, of Calvinism. Uh, there is some things worth protesting, I think, within uh, the young, restless, and reformed, or what Olson would call high Calvinism. Uh, I think there is some valid critique, and to the extent that he is able to critique that, I find that helpful. But I don't think that, uh, in some respects, he's right, in my view, he's right on the edge of a straw man argument, because it's saying, here's what Calvinism is, and let's run it through the wood chipper. Well, here's what one subset of Calvinism is, or one gr small group within the Calvinist camp uh, this is this. They represent a very small group, and I think they are worth, um, as I said, uh, some critique. But I don't think that they are representative of the whole. I'm hoping, I believe, I trust. It's my trust that the Calvinism and the Arminianism that is um, being represented in this graph uh, represents broad Calvinism or broad Arminianism or general Calvinism or general Arminianism. So when it comes to original sin. Uh, the view is from Calvinism, total depravity and guilt inherited from Adam. Uh, and uh, within Arminianism, there's a weakness inherited from Adam. Uh, they, the soul is made weak by sin and is still uh, capable of making a decision for Christ. The human will is in bondage to sin. We're going to talk about that in a little bit here. Um, the human will, according to Arminianism, is free to do spiritual good. The grace of God is common grace given to all, saving grace given to the elect. Uh, under the Calvinist rubric, under Arminianism, enabling grace is given to all, but saving grace is given to those who believe. And so there's this sort of, I don't, it's kind of a circular thing that happens with belief and grace and, and how that all works. Um, predestination is rooted in God's decree, whereas predestination in Arminianism is rooted in God's foreknowledge. We'll talk about that a little bit when we get to election. That's a major point of distinction. Uh, and you might be thinking in, uh, at a cursory look at this or at a 10,000-foot view look at this, well, what's the difference between God's foreknowledge and God's, God's decree? Well, it turns out there's a lot. There's, there's, a, there's actually a fairly big difference between those two things. Regeneration, according to the Reformed tradition, is monogernistic, monogernistic meaning. We all remember from our one source, one energy, one place in which this is happening, mono meaning one, uh, and you can see the word energy and, 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 and er, ergistic, one source of, uh, of power. Uh, synergistic is the combination of two or more, synergy. The atonement, Christ's death is a substitutionary penal sacrifice. Uh, within the reform camp, Christ's death is a sacrifice that God benevolently accepted in place of a penalty. And we'll uh, potentially get to that distinction at some point. Uh, extentment of the atonement. The extent of the atonement is intended only for the elect. Uh, as uh, within Arminianism, it's intended for all. We'll look at that when we look at uh, unconditional election. The application of the atonement by the power of the Holy Spirit according to the will of God. Uh, it's applied uh, in the Arminian construct by the power of the Holy Spirit in response to the will of the sinner. The sinner makes an uh, overture to God and God strengthens and empowers uh, the unbeliever. The order of salvation, we'll definitely not be getting to this in this class. We might not even get into it in your class, Peter. Uh, but for those who are interested, the order of salvation or the ordus salutis, as it was taught within uh, the high classical period, election, predestination, union with Christ, calling, regeneration, faith, repentance, justification, sanctification, glorification, uh, I heard Alistair Begg once say to the young, restless, and reformed group, uh, and I think it was an appropriate critique, uh, how many of you can recite the great chain the, of salvation, and uh, meaning the, um, the order of salvation, the order salutis, uh, to be able to kind of rattle off these five or six categories? Uh, great. How many of you can actually offer the gospel to anybody? <laughs> how many of you can share the gospel 
Because uh, sharing the gospel is not the same thing as delineating the order of, uh, the order of salvation. Uh, so I think that's a legitimate critique among the, uh, the young, restless, and reformed. Uh, within the Arminian camp, the order is calling, faith, repentance, regeneration, justification, perseverance, glorification. I think the thing to note here is there's not the same elements and they're not in the same order. And as much as I would enjoy uh, going down that road, we just is outside the scope of this class. And then finally, perseverance of the saints, which we will get to, the per perseverance of all the elect by God's grace, or as we'll see, it's the perseverance of God on behalf of the, uh, of the saints. Not Perseverance of the saints is a bit misleading, uh, suggesting that it's your perseverance that's in view, um, but it's the perseverance of God on behalf of God's people. Uh, according to the Arminian uh, perspective, the perseverance depends on obedience. Obedience. I'm not sure that uh, Zondervan is, uh, would be considered a distinctively reformed or Arminian uh, organization or publisher. I think they're in the business of selling books, and so they're, they're not trying to alienate one group over the other. I think they're trying to do the best that they can of uh, simplifying what would be considered basic or mere Calvinism or basic or mere Arminianism and putting them side by side so that differences can be, can be seen. Anybody have any questions about any of that? Because all of this was sort of a wrapping up of uh, me saying, I'm trying to be as charitable as possible. Yes. My favorite story about this conflict between Arminianism and Calvinism don't give away my story. Charles Simeon and John Wesley? Oh, I had it as uh, Whitfield and Wesley. Bought the throne? No, that's a good story, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, tell that story. I like that story. George Whitfield <laughs> was an evangelical uh, preacher, Calvinist, and John Wesley was an Arminian yep. preacher. And, they, you know, this was a big conflict. Yeah. And somebody asked Whitfield if he'll see Wesley in heaven. And Whitfield said no. And the guy said, really? He said, no, because Wesley will be so close to the throne of God, I will never see him. Yeah. So uh, I thought that was very charitable. Very charitable on the part of, uh, of George Whitfield, who was no wilting tulip <laughs> when it comes to uh, the five points. But there's another story like it uh, by Charles Simeon and John Wesley that I think gives voice to this charitable uh, Reformed attitude that I would like to embody and I would like uh, the Reformed tradition to embody. This illustration comes from an encounter between uh, Simeon and Wesley. Simeon preached a Cal general Calvinist or a mere Calvinist doctrine at Cambridge. Wesley was famous evangelist known for his opposition to Calvinism. He, he actually wrote several treatises saying, trying to demonstrate why Calvinism was uh, unbiblical and immoral. Um, as Wesley, uh, Wesley indicated in his journal that the two men met on December 20th, 1784, and Charles Simeon recorded their conversation in which he began to question Wesley concerning his theology of salvation. And I want to read to you the transcript that, uh, that Simeon wrote down. He says to Wesley, Sir, I understand that you are called an Arminian, and I have been sometimes called a Calvinist, and therefore I suppose we are to draw daggers. <laughs> But before I consent to begin the combat, with your permission, I will ask you a few questions. Pray, sir, do you feel yourself a depraved creature, so depraved that you would never have thought of turning to God if God had not first put it into your heart? Yes, says Wesley, I do indeed. And do you utterly despair of recommending yourself to God by anything you can do and look for salvation solely through the blood and righteousness of Christ? Yes, solely through Christ. But sir, supposing you were at first saved by Christ, are you not somehow or other to save yourself afterward by your own works? No, I must be saved by Christ from first to last. Allowing then that you were first turned by the grace of God, are you not in some way or other to keep yourself in your own power? Perseverance. No, says Wesley. Uh, what then are you to be upheld every hour and every moment by God as much as an infant in its mother's arms? Question? Yes, altogether. And is all your hope in the grace and mercy of God to preserve you unto his holy kingdom? Yes, I have no hope but in him. 
So then Simeon concludes, Then, sir, with your leave, I will put up my dagger again, for this is all my Calvinism. This is my election, my justification by faith, my final perseverance. It is in substance all that I hold, and as I hold it, and therefore, if you please, instead of searching out terms and phrases to be a ground of contention between us, we will cordially unite in those things wherein we agree. So I thought that was very kind, very, uh, very courageous. I don't think um, Simeon or Whitfield is trying to paper over the differences. There are differences, and they are real. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we should. Um, my my view is uh, I want to be as charitable in um, in my position as possible. I I hold to the Reformed tradition. I hold to these. Uh, this system of theology, I, I hold to the doctrine. Um, it was it was uh, a difficult experience, as I said. My paradigm had to bl- had to crumble and had to be rebuilt. If you've ever read um, C.S. Lewis's short essay entitled something like "Essays from a Tool Shed" or "Meditations from a Tool Shed," has anybody ever heard of that? He talks about the difference um, between looking. Along the light and looking in the light, and he's got this uh, he's got this beam of light coming through the tool shed where Lewis is standing. I can't draw anything to scale. You figure it out. Let's do it. Let's at least do this. All right. There's the sun. There's this beam of light coming, and he goes into this tool shed, and he can see the beam of light because he's standing outside of the light. He can see it. He could, he could maybe measure it. He could discern that it's there. But when he stepped into the light and he looked along the light, there's a difference between looking at the light and looking along the light. When he looked along the light and he looked through the crack that was coming through the tool shed, he could see the trees. He could see the sun. He could see uh, the birds outside. He could see the whole world opened up to him. And so uh, one of the things that I want to suggest is that there's a difference between looking along the light and looking in the light. And... Um, it took me a while to come, if you can excuse the phraseology, because this, this is not a salvation issue, but I came into the light. I had to be able to see inside of it. There was only so much I could get by being outside of it, looking at it, trying to discern and understand it. There's a certain knowledge that comes by being inside of it. And that was a hard transition, to come inside the light it was not easy. It took time. Uh, things had to come down. Other things had to be opened up. And then I was able to understand uh, a little bit more the positions that are, that are held um, once I had come inside the camp, so to speak. Okay. Any questions about that before we go back to total depravity? Yes, Mary. I, I don't know if there's a question about that. This is when we were talking about this chart. The difference between the, and the saving grace given to the elect Versus saving grace given to those who believe. And what's, like, what is an elect then? Grace of God. Common grace given to all, saving grace given to the elect. That's right at the heart of election. We'll get there at the very next category. It's, we're at T and then unconditional election. I could, I could go down that road with you now, but then we wouldn't finish total depravity, and I'm going to get to it anyway. So if you could just, it's a great question, yeah, but if you can, it's also a great way to make sure you come back next week. <laughs> yeah, so that, uh, I, I set the hook. All right, so uh, I'm just going to punt quickly. All right, any other questions before moving on of a general nature before we dive back into total depravity? Yes? So in your change of view, Yes, it was uh, two things. It was, well, maybe it was three things. It was a wrestling with texts that I had previously glossed over um, and really beginning to wrestle with the implications of what that meant. And then reconciling those biblical positions within some kind of coherent whole. I am far more my own inclination um, and, and my, um, my makeup, my, my personality is far more inclined towards biblical theology than systematic theology. 
Um, I'm more of a narrative kind of a person, the, the poetic, the history, those kinds of things. But I also know that you, you, you need a system. You need some kind of a, uh, a theology that holds the pieces together. And so I had to, I had to recognize that I was going to have a system whether I acknowledged it or not. Everybody has a system. Everybody has a paradigm. Uh, just like everybody has a liturgy. There's, there's even churches that are the free church movement. They have a liturgy whether they want to say it or not. It's as we joke around uh, uh, sometimes even within our own evangelical circles, the liturgy is six songs and a sermon. That's the liturgy. Uh, so everybody has a liturgy, even if you don't want a liturgy. And everybody has a system, whether you think you have one or not. And I was interested in having a system that was coherent and made sense of, of the Bible and of itself. It, it, it held together. And so I had to wrestle with texts that I had previously glossed over and, and really start to drill down to what was implied and being communicated by those texts. And to understand those texts within a system as a whole. And those things together put me in this unique position. And this was why things crumbled. It, it, I'll explain it to you this way. And I got this from the former president at Trinity Seminary in a systematics class that I took with him. One of the reasons why the mainline churches went the way that they did is they read their Bibles like this as opposed to reading their Bibles like this. Now, just that little visual made all the sense in the world for me. When you read your Bible like this, you're in control. You are explaining what the Bible means. This is what this has to mean. Based on whatever system you're bringing to bear, whatever experiences you're having, you're shaping and informing the text. Now, we all, we all there's no... There's no um, as uh, Leslie Newbegin would say, there's no epistemic Switzerland. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? Epistemology is a theory of knowing. It's how you know. It's a philosophy of knowing. And there's no neutral ground when it comes to how we know things. We come with our experiences. We come with all the books that we've read. We come with all the children's stories we've heard growing up. And so there's no epistemic neutral ground. But you can at least acknowledge that you come to the text with certain biases. And when you acknowledge that and you try to relinquish yourself of that and allow the text to stand above you and to make its sense, give its meaning and sense to you rather than you deriving sense and meaning from it, rather than extracting from it, allowing it to um, permeate you, that's a totally different orientation. And it's an incredibly humbling one. Because I was studying theology. I was, you know, I thought I was a pretty bright guy. I had taken philosophy classes and I had taken, I'd grown up in the church. I was, I didn't know a time in my life I didn't know Jesus. And now all of a sudden I felt like I don't know anything. What in the, what in the world happened to me? It was totally disorienting. And so I had to allow, I had to get comfortable with my station, with where I was in the hierarchy of authority. And I wasn't, I wasn't the arbiter of meaning. I was the, recip the recipient of, the, of what God was trying to say. And so once my, once my paradigm shifted that way, everything changed. I went from a view from below to a view from above. And I, I think that was the game changer for me. Yeah. All right. I'm going to move us on. Otherwise, we won't get through total depravity. Um, I know you're all dying to read more about total depravity. Actually, we're going to want our Bibles. Hopefully you have your Bibles. What does the Bible have to say about total depravity? Again, we talked about the difference between total depravity and utter depravity. They're not the same thing. Utter depravity is you're as evil as you can possibly be. Total depravity says there's not one square inch of this thing we call the human heart and the human life that is not... Uh, terribly and fully affected by sin, ravaged by sin. And so, if you have your Bibles, I might run through these rather quickly. Um, there's several things that the Bible has to say about the human heart. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. If you can get there quickly, you'll see that it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. 
That sounds pretty absolute, beyond cure. Now, it's not beyond God's cure, but it's speaking from the position of, of Jeremiah and the world in which he's ministering. There's no self-help here. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Uh, that, that seems pretty definitive as to the problem, the definition of the problem. The heart is, the heart is broken by sin. It's totally affected by sin. And then if you have Romans chapter 3, and you look at verses 10 and 12, Paul, he's actually quoting Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 as he says uh, what he has to say about uh, total depravity. He says, in pretty demonstrative, sweeping, absolute terms, there is no one righteous, not even one. It's fairly totalitizing and absolutizing. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. That doesn't mean you don't understand how to milk the cow. You don't understand how to, how to uh, glean the, 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 the fields. There's no one who understands godliness. There's no one who understands righteousness. There's no one apart from God who understands the law and can keep it. There's no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. Nobody seeks God. It's not our natural, it's not our natural default setting. Sin has made us enemies of God. We've all turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, again, that's not to say that there is no morality to be understood in the world. This starts to get a little bit into what you were asking, Mary, about the difference between common grace and, and saving grace. There is a common grace in the world. We talked about it last week when we talked about the intrinsic goodness of creation. Even sin cannot overcome God's intrinsic goodness uh, in the created order. Because if it did, we would go from being to non-being. If things were utterly depraved, things would cease to exist. But God has stamped the world with His approval saying it is good, it is very good, the whole created order as a totality is very good, and sin can't undo it. But all parts of creation and all parts of the human heart have been affected by sin, and we can know general basic principles of right and wrong. Uh, even heathens know sometimes, most of the time, to care for their children, although we're challenging that idea in America. I think these days and other parts of the world as well and other parts of history, uh, we can have a basic conception of, of that which is right and that which is wrong. But no one does good when it comes to their right relationship with God. We're enemies of God. We said, I'm going to have it my way. We turned our backs on God and we're not looking back. That's what the Genesis story is all about. After they ate... Did they want to see God's face? No. What did they do instead? They hid. No one's seeking after God. That's what sin is. That's what it means to be totally depraved. This is why um, James Boyce will refer to this as radical depravity. It affects everything radically. Or radical corruption. Everything is corrupt. Now, total depravity is you're dead in your sins. Things are deceitful, or we're deceitful. The heart is deceitful. No one is righteous. There are consequences to this situation, and God uh, tells us what the consequences are of sin throughout the Scriptures. You go all the way back to the beginning, and what do you read in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17? God gives the promise to Adam and Eve and says, you can eat of any of the trees, any of the fruit-bearing uh, bushes and trees, anything you want in the garden, except for the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on that day, well, let's just go read the text itself. This is chapter 2 of Genesis, verses 16 and 17. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and die. So what is the condition of fallen human men and women? Dead. So it's not, it's not uh, the Princess Bride when we go back to the beginning. And, and, and uh, Wesley, is, he's not dead. He's mostly dead, which means a little bit alive. Just a little bit. You think it'll work? It'll take a miracle. Uh, 
There's a little bit of life left in uh, resident within the human condition. That's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, the Bible is so emphatic that it suggests that you will die and you will continue to be dead until you're dead. That's the, that's the, the emphasis that's placed upon the text. You, are, you will die on the day of the end of it. You will die and you'll continue to die until you're dead. You will be the walking dead. You're dead. So what's significant about the Genesis account is that the consequence of Adam's and Eve's sin is described as death, not mere imperfection, not weakness, uh, or a weakening of one's innate capacity to do good. It refers to the spiritual condition of those who have sinned against God as dead. And who has sinned against God? Everybody. Not, on, not when you turn two years old, not when you're four years old, not when you're 16, not at the age of accountability. Everybody has sinned against God in Adam and Eve. And there, there's, a, there's a theological category that describes all that, but let me just share with you very quickly that the Bible's conception of what's happening here at the garden is Adam and Eve stand in the place of the entire human race. They represent everybody. That's the same uh, rationale at work in the way God has ordered all things that allows Christ to represent everybody. He, he represents the human condition. Adam and Eve represent everybody. And so uh, Adam and Eve sin, and therefore we all sin. This is known as the doctrine of original sin. And this doctrine has been fought and resisted for centuries I would commend to you at uh, some point, if you're interested, to read Alan Jacobs' fine work, uh, Original Sin, A Cultural History. And he traces how this, um, how this doctrine has been resisted because it's just, it's really, you know, it's just not nice. It, it puts humanity in such a bad light. Gosh, you know, and you got folks like Rousseau who says, eh, it's really not sin that ruins people, it's society. Every child comes to us as a tabla rasa, tabla uh, rasa, a blank slate. And it's society that malforms them and malshapes them. And really quick, it's the irony of ironies is that John Wesley, of all people, wrote a sermon just as Rousseau was coming out with this idea of the tabla rasa where he was talking about children being a brood of vipers. Uh, and that their wills are, are, are they're natural-born atheists, is what he says. Sounds pretty reformed to me. Um, I'm gonna, let me uh, Joanne, Joan was in front of you. Go ahead, Joan. <laughs> yeah. Parents spend their whole life from day one teaching the child to be good. Yeah. They never teach them to be bad. Right. They come by. It just happens, huh? When our daughter was baptized at four years old here, she was a little bit late to the baptism game, and she was squirming out of my hands, and she was yelling, I don't want water on my head. I had to make a decision. It was a, it was a leadership moment. And so I had to just give her, I was looking at the choir, I had my back turned to the congregation, it was a pastor here at the church, and I just, it, was, I had, it had to be done. I just gave her a little swat, and this whole choir saw it, and they were like, you remember that, Leslie? <laughs> and I just turned around to the congregation and said, that's why we believe in total depravity, folks. This is, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> totally depraved, yes. Oh, I was at a meeting at Harvard when I was up at Gordon, and a Christian musician was, was sharing all this. It was, it was a evangelist meeting. He made a simple comment I never forgot. He said, I, I didn't believe in total depravity until I had a two-year-old. Right. <laughs> Every two-year-old will make you a true believer. Total depravity. Okay, moving on. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. If you have your Bibles, you can keep that open. We're going to stick with it for a couple of seconds here. This is what Paul, continuing to describe the human condition. This is what I would refer to you as a biblical anthropology. What does it mean to be human? Well, Paul tells us. There's no, there's no need to wonder. It's here. He says... And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you walked. He's referring to all of humanity. This is the human condition. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Like everybody else, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. It's fairly absolute, absolutizing. Now, there are three generic conceptions of the human condition of anthropology without history. There's the optimist anthropology. Man is well. And please, I don't mean to be gender exclusive, but I'm using the classic historic sense of the word. Man is well. All is well. Everything's fine. It's just society that kind of corrupts. The other one you might call the second view is the realist view. It says, well, man is sick. There are problems here. Um, but we can overcome the problems. And then there's what I'll call the revelationist, the one who looks to the scriptures. Man is dead. It's either man is well, man is sick, or man is dead. And the Bible teaches that man is dead. The sinner is dead. And not only is the sinner dead, according to Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, the sinner actively practices evil. Wonder what man's going to do. No need to wonder. We know what he's going to do. He's going to actively practice evil. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, and once you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, actively practicing disobedience and evil. The, the sinner is enslaved, enslaved to the prince of the powers, uh, uh, the, the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Enslaved to passions, the bent desires. The, original, the, the conception of original sin is that our love and our affection was intended to be for God. God was the proper object of our love. And sin corrupted that love so that it got bent inwards. And we became lovers of self more than lovers of God. And so we are enslaved to our passions. And our passions are always and only and continually focused on ourselves. That's the death. We don't want anything to do with God. We only are interested in ourselves. And then the sinner by nature, as a result is an object of God's wrath. They, um, he says, uh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath. So this is the situation, folks. Because of sin, we are dead. We are disobedient. We are enslaved. We are constantly practicing evil. We have no interest in God. We don't want to look to God. We don't want to turn to God. We're dead. There's really very little reason for optimism and hope in ourselves if this is the condition. And this seems to be the condition that is uh, referred to, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, both witnesses in union with each other, speaking with one voice and one accord, as to the human condition. This is the bad news. Now, you always have to start with the bad news when it comes to the gospel in order for the good news to make any sense. And so we can't skimp on, we can't shade, we can't edge around the bad news. This is the bad news. And it's the bad news, being so bad, is what makes grace so wonderful. I think this is one of the reasons why I became not only a convert to the Reformed tradition, but an appreciator uh, of the Reformed tradition is it gave me a renewed found affection for God and grace. Grace came alive. Grace became grace because it was all of God. And all I could do in response is say, thank you. Thank you. I, the, the problem was not only bleak, the problem was it was done. There, the the, the game was over, yet out of death you brought life. You called me to yourself. So I would, I'd love to continue down this train of total depravity. At this rate, oh, man, good thing we're getting like 
five days, eight hours a day. Peter, well, my kids through limited atonement. I don't know. Um, I want to finish up. I'm going to finish up <laughs> really, really quickly next week, total depravity, lightning round, and then we're going to get into unconditional election. Because uh, as we'll see, the system holds together. There is no such thing as a four-point Calvinist. Uh, they just, these things work together. I mean, I, I understand the charitable nature of trying to say that, but uh, it's not. And I think the reason, and I'll, make, I'll try to make the case as to why that's not a great way of looking at things, because I think it, it begins to enervate and weaken the last, uh, it's not part of the five, uh, the five, not a part of Tula, but part of the, it's the fifth sola, to God be the glory, the glory of God alone. All of salvation is a work of God alone. And if, if we don't recognize that from first to last, glory is taken from God. It's all about God. And I think uh, as we see how these things hold together, we'll see that a little bit more clearly. Okay, folks, I'm sorry you can't take any questions. I've got to get upstairs for the next uh, service. But um, hopefully keep me to the charitable nature of this all. I'm trying to be charitable. I want to be charitable. Uh, I hope I'm being charitable. I love Arminians. Um, and uh, I love uh, studying this all with you. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for grace, and we thank you, Lord, for the totalitizing power of grace that comes from you, and that it is good enough and strong enough to overcome the death that is ours. That's our inheritance. That's our legacy, death, death upon death upon death. But when you take action, Lord, you can bring life out of death. And only you can do it. And so for that, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, folks. Thanks. I'll see you next week.